All right, so today we're doing a deep dive into something that I'm sure you guys see all the time as healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. pneumonia. But we're going to really kind of focus in on the differences between mycoplasma pneumonia and typical bacterial pneumonia. Right. Because making the right call there, you know, can really impact patient care and outcomes. Absolutely. You know, they both involve inflammation of the lungs. Right. But they have very distinct characteristics. Yeah. That demand kind of different approaches to how we diagnose and treat them. Okay. So to kind of unpack all of this, let's start with like, what are we even dealing with here? Chilling. Like, what's the root cause of these infections? Yeah. So with mycoplasma pneumonia, sometimes called walking pneumonia, it's caused by the bacterium mycoplasma pneumonia. Right. And then you've got typical bacterial pneumonia, which is usually triggered by the usual suspects like streptococcus pneumonia and haemophilus influenza. Yes. And so that difference in the root cause, I think, is really where it gets interesting. Absolutely. And what's so fascinating about that is how that difference translates to the clinical presentation. Right. So mycoplasma pneumonia often has much milder symptoms. Yeah. While typical bacterial pneumonia tends to hit a lot harder and faster. Right. And we've got a chart here that actually compares the symptoms side by side. Yeah. And so I think one of the first things we can look at is the cough. Right. With mycoplasma, typically you see a dry cough or if there is mucus, it's very minimal. Yes. Yeah. Typical pneumonia, on the other hand, usually involves a more severe cough yeah. and, let's say, you know, more colorful sputum production. Exactly. So the character of the cough itself, I think, can be really valuable. Absolutely. For sure. Then there's the fever. With mycoplasma, you might see a low-grade fever. Yes. But typical pneumonia often presents with a high fever, mm -hmm. often exceeding 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So that's a big difference, too. It is. And I think you're hitting on a very important point. Yeah because that can play a crucial role in gauging the severity of the infection and deciding, you know, how urgently we need to intervene. Right, exactly. Then you've got chest pain. That's rarely a complaint with mycoplasma. Right. right. But with typical pneumonia, patients often report sharp, stabbing chest pain, especially when they take a deep breath or when they cough. Yeah. So if a patient comes in complaining of that type of chest pain, I mean, that definitely raises your suspicion for typical pneumonia. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's, I think, connecting it to the bigger picture, right? Understanding these subtle differences in these symptoms, it can be really invaluable. Yeah. Because, you know, recognizing that a patient with a dry cough and no chest pain is much less likely to have a serious bacterial pneumonia can really help you in your initial diagnostic approach. Right. And, you know, and determining the urgency of treatment. For sure. For sure. Now, let's talk about the onset of the symptoms, because I think that's a big one, too. Hmm. Mycoplasma pneumonia is kind of sneaky. Yeah, it is. It develops gradually over one to four weeks. Right. While typical pneumonia tends to have a much more sudden onset, often knocking patients off their feet within a day or two. Right. Yeah. You go from feeling fine to feeling really terrible very quickly. So that difference in the timeline, too, I think is a crucial factor in kind of piecing together the patient's history. Absolutely. You know, just asking the patient about the duration and the progression of their symptoms can offer, you know, crucial insights into what's going on. Yeah. So a history of, you know, slowly worsening symptoms over a couple of weeks is more suggestive of mycoplasma. Right. Than a sudden onset of a high fever and a productive cough. And of course, we can't forget about our pediatric patients. Of course not. You know, young children with mycoplasma pneumonia, mm -hmm. they can sometimes present with, you know, what we call atypical symptoms. Right. Like diarrhea, sneezing, or wheezing. Yeah. So that's something to keep in mind, especially when those, you know, classic respiratory symptoms aren't quite as prominent. You're right. It's a really good point because children, especially the younger ones, they can present with just a wider range of symptoms. Yeah. So I think a thorough understanding of all the potential manifestations is critical for getting an accurate diagnosis. So we've talked about all the different ways that these two types of pneumonia kind of present, mm. but how do we actually confirm our suspicions? Right. What tools are available to us for diagnosis? Well, you know, luckily we have several diagnostic tools at our disposal. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have clinical evaluation, chest x-rays, PCR testing, right. serological tests, sputum cultures, and blood tests. And each of these tools has its own strengths and limitations. Yeah. And, you know, selecting the right test depends on the individual patient and the clinical scenario. Okay. So that's quite the arsenal there. It is. But with so many options. How do we choose the most appropriate tests in a busy clinical setting? Right. I mean, we can't 
order every test for every patient. You're absolutely right. Efficiency is key, yeah. you know, in clinical practice. Right. So for mycoplasma pneumonia, PCR testing has emerged as a highly sensitive and specific method. Okay. So explain what that is for our listeners. Sure. So PCR or polymerase chain reaction directly detects mycoplasma pneumonia DNA from a respiratory sample. Okay. So it provides a very definitive diagnosis. We're looking for the genetic fingerprint. Exactly. Straight to the source. Exactly. I got it. Now, what about chest x-rays? Yeah. Are there any specific findings there that can kind of point us in the right direction? Chest x-rays can provide valuable information, but it's important to remember that they don't always offer, you know, a clear-cut distinction. Okay. So with mycoplasma pneumonia, you'll often see patchy infiltrates. Right. Which basically means there are areas of increased density in the lungs. Right. And those appear as kind of hazy shadows on the x-ray. Yeah. Typical bacterial pneumonia, on the other hand, tends to show more localized consolidation. Okay. So a denser, more defined area of opacity. So we're looking for those distinct patterns. You got it. It's like looking for, you know, specific footprints at a crime scene. It's okay. And then when it comes to typical bacterial pneumonia, the sputum culture remains, you know, the cornerstone of diagnosis. Absolutely. Because that allows us to identify the specific bacteria that's causing the infection, right? Yes. And that's crucial for guiding our antibiotic selection. For sure. And, you know, with rising antibiotic resistance, identifying that specific pathogen is becoming more and more crucial yeah. to make sure that we're using the most effective treatment and not contributing to that problem. That's a really good point. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about treatment for both of these. Okay. What are the go-to antibiotics for mycoplasma pneumonia? So the first line antibiotics for mycoplasma pneumonia are typically macrolides like azithromycin okay. or tetracyclines like doxycycline. Okay. In adults, we also sometimes consider fluoroquinolones. Okay. But one of the interesting things about mycoplasma pneumonia is that a lot of cases actually resolve on their own. Oh, wow. Without any antibiotic intervention. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Thanks to its generally milder nature. So the body's own immune system can sometimes fight it off? It can. It does a pretty good job. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So then how do we decide which patients truly need antibiotics and which can just kind of ride it out? Right. Well, that's where, you know, good clinical judgment comes into play. Yeah. You know, factors like the patient's age, their overall health status, yeah. the severity of their symptoms, and the presence of any underlying medical conditions all have to be carefully considered. So it's a balancing act. It is. Weighing the benefits of the antibiotics against the risks of overuse absolutely and the resistance you hit the nail on the head okay it's about finding that sweet spot yeah providing the right treatment for the right patient at the right time yeah and of course patient education is key here yeah we need to emphasize that even if the symptoms improve very quickly they need to finish all of their antibiotics right to ensure that infection is really gone absolutely now typical bacterial pneumonia it seems like things get a little bit more intense. Yeah, you could say that. Right. So with typical bacterial pneumonia, we often have to take a much more aggressive approach. Okay. Antibiotics are still, you know, the cornerstone of treatment. Yeah. But the specific choice depends on the bacterial culprit. Right. Identified through that sputum culture. Right. So we're really playing detective here. We are. You know, tailoring our treatment strategy to that specific bacteria that we're going up against. Exactly. What are some of the antibiotics used in those cases? So we might use penicillins like amoxicillin, mm. cephalosporins, right. macrolides, or fluoroquinolones, just depending on the organism and its susceptibility patterns. Okay. But beyond just the antibiotics, supportive care is really important. Right. This includes things like ensuring they're adequately hydrated, yeah. encouraging rest, yeah. and providing over-the-counter meds for fever and pain relief. So it sounds like a much more comprehensive approach. It is. Targeting both the infection and just the patient's overall well-being. Yes. Now, in more severe cases, we might even be talking about hospitalization. Absolutely. So for patients with severe typical bacterial pneumonia, especially those who are older, have underlying medical conditions or who present with complications, hospitalization is definitely necessary. Right. Intravenous antibiotics and just close monitoring in a hospital setting can be life-saving. So this really highlights the difference in severity. It does. Between these two. It does. You know, it's not just sniffles versus cough. Right. It's outpatient versus inpatient. You got it. And that's why recognizing these distinctions early on is just paramount. 
yeah. to make sure we're getting the best possible outcomes for our patients. Now let's step back a little bit and talk about who's vulnerable to these types of pneumonia. Okay. Who are we keeping an eye on? Right. Who are we, you know, really vigilant about? So when it comes to mycoplasma pneumonia, it's often children and young adults. Who are most susceptible, especially those living or working in crowded settings? Okay, so like schools and dorms. Yeah, schools, dorms, military barracks. Right. Close quarters, lots of people. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What about typical pneumonia? So we see an increased risk at both ends of the age spectrum. Okay. So young children under two years old and then adults over 65. Okay. Additionally, chronic health conditions like asthma, COPD, heart disease, or diabetes, mm. a weakened immune system from things like HIV or cancer. Right. And lifestyle factors like smoking. Right. Those all increase susceptibility to typical bacterial pneumonia. So it's a combination of age. Yes. Underlying health issues. Yes. And lifestyle choices. Yes. Yeah. That can really tip the scales. Exactly. And, you know, understanding those risk factors helps us identify those patients who may benefit from, you know, closer monitoring, more proactive preventative measures like vaccination mm -hmm. or even early intervention with antibiotics if they develop symptoms that are suggestive of pneumonia. While most cases of pneumonia, especially those caused by mycoplasma pneumonia, resolve without any long-term consequences. Okay. We always need to be aware of that potential for complications, yeah. particularly with that typical bacterial pneumonia. So that's a great segue into our next part of the discussion. Let's take a look at the potential complications that can arise. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so let's start with typical bacterial pneumonia. One of the most common complications we see is pleural effusion, okay. which is basically a buildup of fluid in the space between the lungs and the chest wall. Right. This can cause shortness of breath, chest pain, yeah. and in some cases might require drainage. So it's not just the infection itself we're worried about, right? but the body's response to it. Exactly. So the inflammation that's triggered by the bacteria can lead to you know, that fluid accumulation mm -hmm. in the pleural space, and then that can further compromise lung function. Exactly. And another serious complication to watch out for is a lung abscess, Okay. which is basically a collection of pus within the lung tissue itself. Right. And abscesses can be really tough to treat, Yeah. often requiring a long course of antibiotics or even surgery in some cases. Right, right. That gets pretty intense. And then, of course, there's always the risk of sepsis. Of course, yeah. Which is, you know, that life-threatening condition that occurs when the body's response to infection spirals out of control. Right. And sepsis is a major concern with any serious infection. Yeah. And pneumonia is no exception. Right. It requires, you know, really rapid recognition and aggressive treatment yeah. with 5 E fluids and broad spectrum antibiotics. Yeah. To control the infection. To control that infection and support the patient's hemodynamics. And then in the most severe cases, you can even see respiratory failure. You can, yeah. Where the lungs are no longer able to, you know, provide enough oxygen. Right. To meet the body's demands. Exactly. And respiratory failure is a medical emergency. Right. Often requiring mechanical ventilation. Right. To support breathing and maintain that oxygenation. So really, you know, this kind of highlights the importance of early recognition mm -hmm. and intervention, you know, to prevent these complications from even developing. For sure. Absolutely. So the potential complications of typical bacterial pneumonia, definitely nothing to take lightly. Yeah. Really underscores why that prompt diagnosis and treatment is so crucial. Now, what about mycoplasma pneumonia? Right. I mean, we know it's typically milder. Right. But are there any potential complications that we should be aware of? So... While mycoplasma pneumonia generally follows a milder course, right. it's important to remember that complications can still occur. Okay. One that we should be aware of is encephalitis. Encephalitis. Yeah. Okay, so inflammation of the brain. Yes. That's kind of unexpected. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's not something you think about right away. I wouldn't think respiratory infection, yeah. inflammation yeah. of the brain. Exactly. Yeah. Those two things don't necessarily go together for me. Right, well, and the exact mechanism isn't totally understood. Okay. But the thinking is that in some cases, the immune response that's triggered by the mycoplasma infection mm. can mistake attack brain tissue, wow. leading to encephalitis. Yeah, and it's relatively rare, but it's something we need to be aware of, Yeah, especially if a patient with mycoplasma pneumonia starts to show any neurological symptoms. So we're talking about things like headaches, 
headaches, confusion, seizures, wow, altered mental status. Yeah, all of that. So those are definitely some red flags. Yeah, anything like that should prompt further investigation. Okay. Now, another possible complication, although less common than encephalitis, is hemolytic anemia. So hemolytic anemia, meaning the destruction of red blood cells. Exactly. That's interesting. So how does that happen? So mycoplasma pneumonia can actually attach to red blood cells. Wow. And in some cases, this can trigger an immune response that leads to the destruction of those cells. Interesting. So then you see fatigue, shortness of breath. Right. And pallor, you know, all the classic signs of anemia. The classic signs of anemia. And again, it's not common, but it's something to be aware of. Yeah. Especially if the patient just isn't improving as expected. So even though mycoplasma pneumonia is, you know, often called walking pneumonia because it's milder. Right. It's clear that we shouldn't let our guard down. No, not completely. We still need to be really vigilant. Yeah. And monitor those patients or any signs of these potential complications. We yeah. really delves into the complexities of pneumonia, the different types, you know, the diagnostic tools, the treatment strategies. But even beyond the clinical knowledge, yeah, I think we emphasize the critical thinking, you know, careful observation, understanding our patients and their yeah. needs and their risk factors. Yeah, being a good doctor goes beyond just knowing the facts. Exactly. It's about being a good clinician. And as healthcare professionals, we're always learning. And, you know, pneumonia is common, but it's not always straightforward. Right. <laughs> so stay curious, stay informed, and never underestimate the power of careful observation and good clinical reasoning. That's a great message to end on. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. My pleasure. And to our listeners, you know, keep up the amazing work that you do. Yes. Your dedication to your patients is truly inspiring. It's been a pleasure. Until next time. Stay well, everyone. Stay well and keep learning. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.